What about core loss? These are core loss density curves. And these are, again, for MPP cores with, uh, this is either with a 200 perm or a 300 perm. That means a different amount of gapping in the material. And if you look along the x-axis here, on the, the, the far left is 0.01 Tesla. 0.1 Tesla is where that red line is drawn. And that, that would be fairly high excitation of this kind of core. And remember now, this is not the DC excitation. This is the AC excitation, or the amount of ripple current flowing in each, um, each cycle. And if you look at the top red curve on this diagram, that's our 300 kilohertz curve, you'll see the red line from the bottom, 0.1 Tesla, goes up there, read it across on the left, and it comes out with about 5,000 milliwatts per centimeter cubed. So that's uh, actually 5 watts per centimeter cubed. And if you imagine just a 1 cubic centimeter of core material and what it would be like to put 5 watts in there, you'll immediately realize that that's too much. So you're unlikely to use this core with 0.1 Tesla AC excitation. You're going to have to back off a little way here to get the core losses down. Notice if you look to the left of the curve, the, these things fall off very rapidly. If I was only exciting at 10 millitesla, then I'd only have about 40 milliwatts per centimeter cubed. So things change rapidly as we try to push the cores harder. Now we know that the powdered cores are better in terms of the saturation level we're allowed to have. And for the DC inductance, that's certainly a good thing. So why should we use ferrites? Well, we use ferrites because they have the absolute lowest loss. So if we take the same 300 kilohertz 0.1 Tesla excitation, we see now that the core loss is actually down to 0 0.35 watts per centimeter cubed. It's better than 10 times better than the MPP cores. And this holds for all the powder cores. You may go to uh, something like a cool mu and say, well, this is going to run cool because that's what its name is but it's cool relative to other powdered cores. It is not cool relative to a ferrite with the same level of excitation. So be careful on those choices. Core loss equations. Everybody likes to have spreadsheets these days and MathCAD or something to design their cores. And they don't like to use a table with a log-log curve showing what the losses are at different frequencies. So we use what we call the Steinmetz equation, which approximates these curves. And it's the loss in the core is a constant with the frequency raised to an exponent and delta B raised to an exponent. Been around for a long, long time. And for some reason, this gets accepted as being more accurate because it's an equation and we can see it and we can put it in the spreadsheet and we can play with it. But the only accurate data we really have is from the core manufacturers, and that is these loss curves that they give us. It's not the equations. They will give us uh, the exponents, but we have to be very, very careful in using that because if you look at the two red lines on the graph here, we see what the slope of the 50 kilohertz line is at the bottom. If we carry that 50 kilohertz slope up to the top and apply it to the 300 kilohertz, we see that the slope has changed and changed significantly. So we cannot use a fixed equation here to do the modeling. We have to do better than that. Several different ways to do it. One is to look at the core loss uh, coefficients that we have from Mag Inc., for example, and they give three different sets of coefficients here, one for 100 kilohertz, another one for 100 to 500 kilohertz, and then another one for 500 kilohertz. So you've got to discreetly jump your values of coefficients. If you look at other vendors, they'll give different jump points. There's no standards. So comparing cores is very difficult to do. I did some work some time ago with an engineer called Art Nace, and we came up with a different way to model this, where we had variable coefficients that smoothly varied. They did not suddenly jump. So here you can have an equation plugged in that changes the slope of the curve according to the data from the manufacturers. 
So you can do it these ways. There's many, many other papers on core loss equations. None of them are right or wrong. All we're doing is approximating curves from vendors. It's all empirical anyway. So it's a question of which one is most convenient and which one gets us to where we want to be as designers. What do I think we need from the manufacturers? Well, they're very busy and they don't have a huge budget. I think the minimum we should expect from them moving forward is to try and get the sine wave test data of a very wide range of frequency, B, and temperature, but for some reason we never get the raw data. I'd like to see something more than just the curves from the manufacturers because we spend all our time trying to decipher those curves and measure them, but it would be really nice if we could get the raw core loss data from them that lets us do, do our own approximation on the curves. Standardization of formulas would be nice. Temperature variation formulas are also important to do rather than just a curve because the temperature variation is huge. And I'd like to see the ability to compare materials from all vendors so we can make better choices and make them very quickly. It's very, very tedious at this point. And of course, we've got the question. I think number one belongs to the vendors of the cores. Number two through five, it would be nice to have somebody to fund that, but that's very difficult uh, in these days of uh, why if someone would be motivated to compare all the materials, except for an internal company thing. I'd like to see a core loss database from all the manufacturers where if they want to play, what you do is you feed in delta B, frequency, material, the duty cycle on, the duty cycle off, and the temperature, and it would just drop out the core loss density. Save us all as designers so much time from looking and slugging through all these different curves, trying to find the curves, and trying to expand them so we can read them. But I don't see any big drive to provide this kind of standardized system. But hopefully, during the next year, when we talk about all these issues with PSMA, there can be some progress in the area. What we'd like to see as designers, what's the dream? Well, I think the design approach that, that some of the power supply manufacturers are users probably, it's like, well, we just need a smaller car. We don't want to think, we don't want to change our power supply, our power supply um, procedures. So just give us high BSAT and give us maybe one-fifth the loss we're seeing with ferrites these days. Now, so if we, if we could change our BSAT of a ferrite to 0.6 Tesla and get down to one-fifth of the loss, then we could do what's shown in this curve here. We could just change the inductor out for a much, much smaller one, and everything would be happy. And the losses on the, co on the core would be fine, and then we could just proceed, and life would be easy. But we probably can't have these things. It seems that ferrites can't go beyond 0.6 Tesla, and the materials that do go beyond there cannot have the low losses. Hopefully, it may be possible, but it will take a lot of investment to develop this. And the core manufacturers are really in a bit of a quandary because once somebody does something like this, it doesn't become a much more expensive core where they can recoup their investment. It's a, it's a very you know dirty industry of pressing powders together. And, uh, and the investment dollars are just not there like they are in the semiconductor industry. So we need to find other approaches to shrinking the magnetics. All is not lost. Now, compromise goal for magnetics. Maybe we can't have 0.6 Tesla and we can't have uh, five times lower, lower losses, but maybe we could get this little yellow triangle worked on. Now, for me, high-frequency development goes up to about 5 megahertz. I, I can't see a lot of motivation for moving beyond 5 megahertz. It's been done many times before, but it hasn't really improved the density very much. But if we can just work on this corner of getting the saturation level design point extended further with lower losses, maybe that would help us. <laughs>